So welcome everyone to episode number 42 of the Average Ontario Anglers Fishing Podcast. Today we have a pretty funny episode. It is entitled, Don't Ice Fish Like a Fool. Have you ever done that, Andrew? Uh, every day I've been alive and it's winter time. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought today we could actually cover some uh, tips and tricks on helping you ice fish more safely, as well as some techniques that might help you catch more fish this winter. But before we start, I would like to say another special thanks to our buddy Ted Williams and Oracle Studios for that awesome super cool intro that he that he did for us. Just so you know, Ted, we've had many, many, many people message us and say how much they really love the new intro. So thanks again for that. Half of those are me just messaging Jesse every time I listen to it. I'm like, <laughs> Jesse, that guy was amazing. So that's why we have so many <laughs> views this month. <laughs> so anyway, before we start, as usual, we have our traditional interesting fishing fact. And to handle that, the man with the increasingly larger growing mustache andrew <laughs> it's migrating across the rest of my face so this has been in the works since last year i want i was gonna do this one last year and like you know what i'm not gonna rush it and i did a bit more research and i wanted to make sure i did it it's true justice so uh there's a couple questions for you jesse in in amongst this do you know have you ever heard of the wavy raid lamp muscle <laughs> Of course I have. Obviously not. <laughs> Isn't it your favorite species in Ontario? <laughs> <laughs> if I knew it existed, maybe. So I'll describe it here briefly. It's a, a medium-sized freshwater mussel. About 10 centimeters in length is its maximum growth. They can live up to 20 years. And they're a yellow or yellowish green rounded shell. And they have thin wavy green lines that are radiating outward from the center of that shell. Uh, they are found in medium to small sized rivers, usually clean water, clear water. So they're even like Lake St. Clair and stuff like that. The river's flowing in. They have like the St. Clair River. That is some of their native habitat is is kind of that section of Ontario and down into the States a bit. Now, what's the burning question on your mind right now about these mussels? I have no idea. How do they reproduce? Oh, that's the, that's, that wasn't the first thing I was thinking the of. That was the thing. second thing I was thinking of. Okay. Okay. Yeah. First of all, mussels in general, have you ever heard about how they act like fish we know they spawn you know we as humans do different things but as as clam or as mussels how do mussels reproduce like i remember watching bbc like or, or blue planet and it's about like corals and they they have all the sperm go out float in the eggs and it just like mixes in the ocean and they do it at the same time and like is that similar so there's a couple different methods so one of the most common ones is uh the female mussels they'll lay eggs and keep them on their in the shell they brood them in a special chamber in their gills the males will then release sperm into the water and the females will siphon in water constantly so that they would eventually pull in some random sperm that's flowing downstream it fertilizes the eggs and then they start to grow inside that that clam some of them again the females will then just expel all these young mussel larvae and they have to, the really cool thing about it is they're actually parasites. Muscle larvae are parasites and they have to attach to a, a host fish on their gills in order to then grow to be juvenile muscles and they just drop off and now they've been scattered and spread around. Hmm. So that's the one method is the females just kind of release them and, and hope that a fish randomly swims into it. Another method that they'll use is that some species will use is they'll kind of have this big clump that looks like something floating downstream and they expect like a fish to come up and eat it. And then the fish eats it because this big burst of these essentially little parasitic uh, muscle larva and they're known as a glo glochida or glochidia and a some weird, it's a weird name. I'm just going to say larva. Gross. Now, the wavy rayed lamp mussel is very special. So the females, they will, uh, they actually target specific fish to be the hosts for the larva. Do you know how they do that? Or, or give me your best guess as to how, you, how, they, how they would do that. Is it by scent? Incorrect. It's actually by sight. Oh. So you're like, how does this mussel do this? So they have, they have an extension of the mantle tissue that's inside of them that resembles a small fish and they push that outside of their shell and they twitch it and it looks like a minnow. Hmm. And so it's, it's like a small lure essentially. And it expects 
And most of the time, it's a smallmouth or largemouth bass will come up and it goes to eat this, this minnow, essentially, that it thinks it's grabbing. When it does so, and you know how bass, they, when they eat, they have this big suction, right? Mm-hmm. So that suction actually bursts the, uh, it ruptures the, the gills in the muscle. So all these larvae are instantly released into that fish's mouth and flows right over top of the gills and they just clamp onto the gills. And they, they'll, they'll hold there until they grow up enough and then they'll drop off. Usually, you know, within a, either sometimes a few days or, or a few weeks. So <laughs> I'm just thinking, imagine well, the three different versions of how muscles like have to reproduce and how these young are. Imagine if you were like driving a boat and you swallow a bug, like just randomly. It's like, okay, like, yeah, that, that happens. That's like the one method where they just kind of release it all into the water and hope a fish comes by. But what if you like, what about the one that leaves like a big clump of them? It's like you're eating a burger, but then you find out like, oh, like, mm, oh, wait, this is made of the cricket protein. It's like, this is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but then the worst of all is you're like, oh, look at this. It's a perfect apple in a tree and you pick it off and you take a bite and then it just explodes and like a bunch of like bugs fly into your mouth and like latch onto your lungs. <laughs> like that's <laughs> these poor bass. That's what happens to these guys. Hey, this is supposed to be called this. interesting fishing fact, not terrifying fishing fact. <laughs> <laughs> but that that is the the very interesting i think uh an exciting way that the wavy raid lamp muscle reproduces that is terrifying if you're a fish i guess <laughs> <laughs> and the cool thing is that is something that can be found in ontario so yeah yeah which is weird. like when i first heard of it i was like that's bizarre where is that amazon but, but yeah it's it's local to ontario and yeah like it, there's there's cool I never realized that the, the small larval state of them was actually like a parasite. They had to latch onto the fish gills, but thankfully it doesn't hurt the fish at all. So it's it's not a deterrent for them at all or, or a downside. That's actually, that was actually very interesting. Yeah. I'm going to give you the first interesting fishing fact rating of 2024, and I'm going to give you a big juicy A+. Plus. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. So before... Before we get into our main topic, we would just like to thank everyone who has recently written us a review. If you listen to this on Apple Podcasts and you can actually type out and write us a review, that would be amazing. Um, We're trying to get our reviews up. They're already amazing. We're trying to get a lot more. And if you're on Spotify, make sure to give us a star rating. And if you're on YouTube, just make sure that you give us a thumbs up on our video as well. So we thank everyone for doing that. So for this week's giveaway partner, we've actually paired up with Limestone Lures. Now, Jeff at Limestone Lures, we met at CanCast last year. We're actually excited to see him again there at CanCast this year in April. And he is a really cool guy, makes tons of cool baits. He lives out in Kingston. We have a lot of his baits in our regular rotation throughout the year. He actually has started making a lot of really cool ice fishing baits So we're actually going to have a giveaway for that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, coming soon throughout the episode. But keep that in mind for this cool episode giveaway. So the episode is called Don't Ice Fish Like a Fool. And like Andrew said, like we've all had, we've all probably done some pretty dumb things when we're ice fishing. And because ice fishing is inherently, could be dangerous, you could say. There are a lot of mistakes that you can make. We're going to talk about some safety mistakes. We're also going to talk about some mistakes that we might do when we're actually fishing. These are mistakes that we've made ourselves so we can tell you what we've learned over the years fishing so that we can show you what uh, success we've had by overcoming our stupidity, so to say. So the first point we're going to talk about is safety. And again, we're talking about mistakes that you could make mistakes that we've made the one of the first things when i think of ice fishing and we're all probably doing it right now in the last few weeks is we're looking at ice reports have you been looking at them andrew i've been trying to keep keep up to date on them absolutely yeah it's it's and it's tough to find to know sometimes exactly where to look to get the accurate ones yeah now the where i usually look is again we have a lot of friends that you know we ice fish with or we or we know from instagram or other places And they will be happy to tell you generally when the ice is safe. And some of these guys and girls actually post ice fishing reports on social media or on YouTube. There's also a lot of like ice fishing operators, like say on Lake Simcoe or other lakes that will go out and show you almost daily the ice reports. So if you're someone like me and Andrew that don't live close by a lake where we can't just be like, you know what, I'll drive down and see how the ice is today. You're going to really rely on these ice reports. and generally take them with a grain of salt 
something that is safe, you know, one day, the next day, it could be a totally different story. Use them to kind of judge how the ice is. Like right now, we're looking to get out this weekend. We've been looking at some ice reports. And if we're hearing like, oh, the ice is only two and a half inches, three inches, we might wait till next weekend. But from the ice reports that we've read and we've seen, we know the ice is thicker than that. So using logic and talking to a bunch of people, we know that it's safe to go out this weekend where we're going to go. So that is definitely one thing, If especially if you're new to ice fishing, definitely check out the ice reports on the lake. It's better to, you know, find these things out before you drive up to the lake and find out that, you know, either there's no ice or very sketchy <laughs> ice that you can't go fishing on, especially if you're driving for hours. That would be terrible. Now, yeah. what would you say is like the second piece of equipment that like anyone, a beginner, you know, an expert ice angler should have in their arsenal? So especially for either early or late ice, anytime when the, the weather changes where it warms up a lot, a spud bar yeah. is yeah. a must have, I would say, on the ice. Do you have one? Uh, I don't, but I would well, borrow yours I have, and yeah. going without you. <laughs> <laughs> I have two now. And it's one of those things that everyone that you talk to that is an experienced ice angler, like we had on Drew from DC Hooked Angling Fishing Guide last week on the podcast. If you haven't heard that episode yet, I really recommend that you do is a great episode and one thing that he said multiple times throughout the episode is you need a spud bar he said a spud bar is your best friend on the ice even if you go fishing yeah. with your buddy the spud bar is your best friend not <laughs> not your best friend so why i know we explained it a little last week andrew but what is the proper way to use a spud bar compared to maybe some of the mistakes you see people using a spud bar one of the, I'll say it, one of the don'ts that I see a lot is people will walk out, they'll go to the edge of the ice, they'll jab a couple times lightly at the ice and like, oh, it hasn't gone through and they'll just start walking out and they walk another 50 feet and they stab again. And the purpose of the spud bar is to make sure your next step is safe. It's like every time you're, you're moving like two feet forward, you're, you're hacking at that ice, seeing, making sure it's safe because underwater currents, they can change what looks like flat solid ice where it should be all four inches thick the whole way across if there's an underwater spring there or if there's a creek mouth that's coming over and there's you know an underwater trench and, and there's maybe warmer water coming up from underneath still you are going to have all of a sudden like slush or one inch of ice or something and that spud bar is going to go right through so you're you can check your step ahead of you yeah so i like you said i see a lot of people oftentimes you'll watch youtube videos or whatever people are ice fishing and they're kind of like stabbing it as they walk beside them. A spud bar is supposed to tell you the ice in front of you is safe. So you should be, especially on, like Andrew said, early ice or late ice when the ice is possibly sketchy, you should be spudding ahead of you as you walk forward cautiously. So that is one thing. And again, spud bars are not, they're not cheap, but they're not expensive. And if you, you know, again, if you're ice fishing, spending 50 bucks, I think, I think the uh, the spud bar that I bought a few years ago was only like 40 bucks. You can get you the can nice get them on sale sometimes. Oh yeah. You can get the fancy ones that, you know, are two piece that are like over a hundred bucks, but you can get one for 50 bucks and that 50 bucks will last you forever unless you drop it down through the ice, which you shouldn't, <laughs> but it should, you should have that thing for years and years. So I think the one that I had, I picked it up at Ganyan sports for like 40 bucks and it was just like a basic model one. And What's going to go wrong with it? It's literally just a steel pipe with a, a chisel head on the end. So <laughs> if you don't have a spud bar or a buddy that's fishing with you that has a spud bar, you should definitely get one because it can save your life. And I've, I've seen some guys, they'll make their own too. It's like some three quarter inch rebar and they would just weld like this big metal blade to the front. It's like, yeah, you for know sure. what? It's better than nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you got, if, if you got the metal and you can, you know how to weld, <laughs> build one yourself they're they're not complicated devices <laughs> but uh but you know trying to use a fiberglass reflector for the end of your driveway and that's going to do nothing like it has to have it has to have weight the weight so yeah. that it can actually your purpose of it is you're trying to push that through the ice your hope yeah. is that it doesn't go through but your goal is to try and push it to the ice every time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And another thing too, is become familiar with how a spud bar works. So like if you hit the ice once and it goes through that ice, isn't safe. If you have to hit the ice three times, four times in the same spot before it breaks through that ice is safer that you can walk on. So you have to know, and it comes from experience, how many hits 
you have to hit the same spot in the ice before it breaks through that makes it safe ice. Again, if you're walking out and you hit one hit and water starts coming up, that's not safe ice. So you really mm-hmm. have to have experience. It, again, talk to someone like we talked to Drew last week. That guy's probably on the ice more than, you know, we have in our whole life in like one year. Because the guy like lives out there. It's like an ice hermit. <laughs> <laughs> but like talk to people that have more experience go fishing with a guide go fishing with a buddy that has more experience and you can pick these things up pretty quick and again it can save your life so that's one thing and i know we kind of talked about inconsistent ice like andrew was saying there's you could be walking and i know this has happened to us we'll we'll be spudding out and you're like this ice is like seven eight inches this is fine no problem then all of a sudden you hit a spot that has two and a half three inches Mm -hmm. and you could have been like just walking through and not paid any attention and all of a sudden you hit this spot with slush and you go straight in especially on larger lakes yeah on on larger lakes especially like i remember fishing lake simcoe and we drill a hole beside a pressure crack and it would be maybe two inches wide and then six hours later it would be two feet wide or four feet wide and what will happen is if that pressure crack opens up and then freezes, it's still only going to have, it's open water below it. It's not going to be the the two feet thick of ice that the rest of the lake is. It's going to be an inch thick or two inches thick. But from the top, especially if it snows on top, you will have no way of distinguishing that that was a pressure crack. before. Yeah, especially if it snows on top. Yeah, Yeah. so really, you really have to, you know, be careful when you're out there because ice, like they said, there's no such thing as safe ice. Ice can change very quickly, especially on big water, like Andrew said especially in areas that have some sort of current on them too. So if you're not familiar, it's better to be safe than sorry and not go out or go with someone that knows the lake very well. So the next thing I've heard a lot is, especially early and late in the season, a lot of people will ask like, is it safe to go ice fishing by yourself? What do you say, Andrew? I would say it's not as safe as going with someone else. You, you, can, do, you can do dangerous things smartly, but it's safer to have a buddy with you. Yeah. And be spread out. Don't stand side by side or else it does nothing. <laughs> it increases yeah. your weight weight load. But if you're spread out, you know, by, you know, 10, 15 feet apart, that that will have someone there who can assist in case there is an emergency. Yeah. And I know like especially early ice, for me anyway, I won't go out by myself until there's six inches. Mm-hmm. Consistently six inches. I'm not going to go out. I know guys will go out in three inches of ice. Don't do that by yourself because if you do fall in, because your chance of falling in on three inches of ice is way higher than on six inches of ice, you do not want to be by yourself out there. I'm not saying you can't get out. I'm not saying you won't be able to make it back to, to shore and get warm, but the odds of that happening are significantly less than if you were with someone that can help you or call for help mm-hmm. at least. So my advice would be, if you, especially if you're if you're not experienced, do not go out by yourself until there's fairly thick ice or there's other people around don't go out in some random back lake in the middle of nowhere by yourself (laughs) bad things can happen yeah and not tell anyone where you're going and all that stuff yeah and even experienced anglers is one thing i do say is whenever i fish by myself you know usually by february when there's lots of ice i always tell someone where i'm going fishing i'll send them a gps pin if there's you know cellular and i'll tell them when to expect to hear a call from me Again, I tell my wife because I'm married, but maybe you can tell someone else if you're not. Even even fishing in the summer, all that stuff too. But winter ice fishing, the dangers all get amped up. Everything is, is it becomes more dangerous. The chance of your boat breaking in half. Yeah, the chance of your boat breaking in half and you falling in is pretty slim. The chance of that ice underneath your feet, you stepping in the wrong spot and falling in is fairly high. <laughs> True. I know... People will say, especially if you're inexperienced, that you shouldn't do this. But even experienced people end up passing away Mm -hmm. on ice fishing accidents. Like I know we had a few years ago, we had a guy that went out by himself and he died. You know, he went under the ice. He couldn't get out because he was by himself. So these things happen. It's, you know, it's not something you want to think about, but it's something that you want to think about to be like, you know, that happened to a very experienced angler. It could happen to me. Be safe. Go with a buddy. Have a spud bar. Have the safety equipment. And that's the next point we're going to cover is safety equipment. And the first point I'll cover is a float suit. Now, I know, and I was in this position for many years, a float suit is really expensive. Like you're going to spend at least five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars on a float suit minimum. And I know like the best time to buy a float suit is at the end of winter when they go on clearance. But 
That's usually you're like, you know what, I'll just get through this year and I'll buy one in the spring and then spring comes along and you forget to buy one. What happened a few years ago is my wife, she's always nervous when I go ice fishing because I used to go by myself because I had, you know, a day off during the week and all my buddies worked during the week and I would go by myself on thick ice and she was always nervous. So she ended up buying me uh, a float suit and I think it was like seven, eight hundred dollars at the time which I get, that's very expensive, especially if you don't ice fish regularly. But think of it this way, you're buying a float suit, which is if you don't know, it's an ice fishing, you know, bib, like super warm, and a really super warm winter coat, but has built in flotation. So if you do fall in, it keeps you afloat, just like the name, it's a float suit. And, and it doesn't retain water. So if you're wearing a down jacket, yeah, that's super warm. But if that gets wet, it holds all that water. Yeah. Float suits don't. Yeah. So it's, again, it's not pleasant to fall in the ice. I've never done it. Thank goodness. But if you're wearing a float suit, it, it increases your chances of getting out. I'm not saying that float suits are perfect, that every time you fall in, you'll, you'll be hundred percent fine. Just like, Oh, this is okay. I'm in a float suit. It's still <laughs> terrifying <laughs> to yeah. fall in. Now float suits, like we said, they're expensive and I get it. If, if you're a normal person, especially in this economy, spending 800 bucks on a, on a float suit, it may not even be possible. But if you can afford one or save up for one, save up a few bucks every month. So next year you can get one. They're really good quality. It'll last you years and years and years. Like the one I have, I got a Striker Climate, which is one of Striker's like higher end float suits. The thing's fantastic. Like it's so warm. It's ridiculous. Like the bib, it's so tough. I can just like fish on my knees. Like outside, if I drill a hole outside, fish on my knees. It's like this thick of padding. So warm. You're just like, you know, when you're ice fishing and it's like, oh man, I'm freezing. Never in that suit. I'm taking the jacket off and the liner inside <laughs> is super warm too. So if you can get one, I highly recommend it. I know they're expensive. And even Andrew, Andrew doesn't have one. And I'm every year, no, I'm like, you got to get one. saving up for one this year. Yeah. You got to get plan, one. So. Yeah. And again, like I said, I recommend, because I've worked at two tackle shops. Check I make out. Jesse walk in front of me. So he's more likely yeah. to fall through than me. I fall in, he'll jump on top of me. <laughs> But my recommendation would be check out sales at the kind of like midwinter even because you have to think like mm -hmm. fishing stores are already like their ice fishing stuff's already on clearance. Like right now I looked, I got an email from Ganyan Sports and it was like ice fishing clearance. It's the second week of January. They're, they need to free up space to get prepped for yeah. steelhead coming in. And, and guess and, what? Right now, yeah. a lot of their float suits right now are like on a big discount right now even. So definitely check that out. I know Cabela's has some good sales sometimes. Ganyan's does a sale oftentimes has some good suits you can get, but if you can get one, it's, it's an investment in your safety, but it's also super warm. So it's really just like a good all around purchase, I would say. Yeah. But again, we went for years without, without having one, but now that I have one, it just gives me that extra peace of mind that I know mm -hmm. if something terrible did happen, it wouldn't be You're as better terrible. prepared. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And they look sick. You look like a rock star out on the water. <laughs> you you're just shit. like walking around. Like, da, da, da. Even if you don't catch fish, you're just like, whatever. I'm good. <laughs> the other thing I'd, I'd say is very important is to have ice picks. Now, a funny story. I got my first ice picks. Uh, now, I'm not talking like ice climbing picks. These are generally, they're on a string and you can kind of run it right between your two, uh, like through your sleeves of your coat so that they're accessible at your hands. Or you can have it just wrapped around your neck and they kind of clip together as, as in a modern style. My first set I got like way back when, and yeah, it was just on, <laughs> you know, remember idiot mittens? You pull one string and you smack yourself with the other because it went through your <laughs> coat. That's that's one of the ways you can have your ice picks. They're handy, they're right at your hands. It's not going to just fall out of your coat. But the, the newer ones, they kind of clip together nicely and hang around your neck. Now, I found those on the ice. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> Someone lost theirs. I hope they got new ones. But I'm hoping that it was just something that was left behind and not, you know, a bad example of, boy, I should have this threaded through my slip coat sleeves. But <laughs> but that's, they're super important. And, and the way if, if you ever fall through the ice, there's even videos of have every single year, like the fire rescue and stuff like that. They will talk about how we get out of the ice, which is important. The picks are help a lot because you're supposed to kind of army crawl with, with your forearm flat against the ice and just pull, pull your body forward. And because your hands are wet, you can kind of freeze them to the ice with your coat sleeves on your way up. And if you're holding picks, you can jab yourself into the ice and you get even more traction to pull yourself forward and kind of just bring yourself onto that, that ice ledge like a seal would come out of a pool or something. So that's how you get out of the ice. And those picks, 
if they're accessible, it is a good idea to have them threaded through your coat sleeves because then you're there, they're at your hands. You're more likely to make use of them than if you have to, you know, hang around your neck. Oh, let me unclip these and get them ready. And you're in freezing cold water. Your yeah. mind is not working right instantly. You don't, <laughs> and you don't want to leave them in your tackle bag. You know, like, yeah. oh, I got picks, yeah. but they're in my tackle bag or my, in have my bucket. Have them accessible. Have them on you. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. honestly, watch watch a video that's put out by, you know, Ontario Safety and stuff like that on how to get out of the ice if you fall through. The more preparation you have, the better. Yeah. And I know I've had a few people tell me like, oh, you know, you should go through the ice like in a safe environment just so you know how it feels. I have. I'm not going to do that myself. I'm not going to like get everything <laughs> wet for that. But if, as, like Andrew said, if you do watch the videos and you have an understanding, I think the main thing is when you first go through the ice, I know it sounds crazy, but remain calm. Don't Absolutely. start freaking out. Remain calm. Give yourself a second to like take a, take a breath and be like, okay, let's do this and know the procedure of how to get out. And mm -hmm. you should be fine to get out, especially if you're yeah. wearing a float suit, like we said. So those are the safety things. Again, heaven forbid you fall through the ice especially if you're by yourself. But yeah. another thing you can have if you are by yourself, and I just actually got one of these like a few years ago, is a whistle. Mm -hmm. And I, I know a lot of people say you should have one and I never had one for years. If you're fishing by yourself, usually Sometimes if you're- Sometimes you're built into the ice picks too. Yep. I have like, you can just buy one of those like Fox 40 whistles. They're mm -hmm. like four bucks, three bucks even, right? Have that around your neck. If you fall through the ice and you can't get out, or something happens or you, you slip on the ice and break your leg. You have a whistle and you can hear a whistle for miles. I forget what this says on the package, but it yeah. says you can hear it so far away. Blow the whistle, get someone's attention. That could really save your life or really save you in a bad situation. So that's a, another A whistle thing. is far louder than yelling and screaming. And you can only yell and scream for so long before your vocal cords give out. So the whistle you can do forever. So the whole time, if you fall through, don't, don't ever feel too that you're like, oh, I'm, I can get, you know, to safety under my own power now. If if you have had a, a bad experience where you've fallen through, let's say you've gotten out of the ice by yourself, okay. And now you're soaked to the bone. It's minus 15, the wind's blowing, and you need to get to shelter so that you can actually warm up so you don't get hypothermia. Start blowing that whistle. Start looking for help however you can. I don't think there's anyone out there on the ice who's not going to see someone who's, you know, fall through the ice and won't do anything they can to help that person yeah i know if i drove four hours north to to go ice fishing today and i'm excited and i see some guy on my walk out i'm like that guy is soaked i'm gonna do whatever i can to help him right away yeah. fishing takes the back burner now his life is more important for sure so hopefully that never happens to you guys but if it does you should be prepared so keep that in mind before we get on to our next the serious topic of yeah. our <laughs> before we get on to our next point i would like to thank our Patreon members, our Patreon members donate a few bucks every month to help cover the cost of the show. There are expenses to running this weekly show, and we would like to thank all of our Patreon members. Some of them have been with us for many months, and we did have a lot of people join in the last month. If you have joined just recently, we really, really appreciate it. You help take a lot of the stress away from running the show because like we said, there are a lot of expenses to running it. It's not just us talking to a microphone. There's lots of um, <laughs> you know, subscriptions to different stuff that we have to do to, to post this and host it and all that stuff. So we do appreciate that. One of the cool things about being a Patreon member this year is what, Andrew? You get entered into the giveaways automatically. Yeah. So unlike last year, we let anyone enter the giveaways, but this year we're only letting Patreon members enter into the giveaways we're going to support those that support the show it, and it's great odds too <laughs> it's pretty good odds so if, you, yeah. if you're interested in entering some of the giveaways that we're going to have multiple times a month you can do that for only two bucks a month so mm -hmm. definitely check that out i have the link below if you'd like to support the show so again we're going to talk about one mistake that we've made ice fishing and it can go either one way or the other and this <laughs> has nothing to do with falling through the ice so all that morbid talk is over. But one thing is, I think a lot of people make this mistake ice fishing, is they either give their bait way too much action, which I think is usually the main flaw, mm -hmm. or not enough action. I know that sounds like, oh, it's either one or the other, but the main one is way too much action. And what I found is I learned a lot, me and Andrew learned a lot once we got the underwater camera, right? Yeah, that was a game changer. Like, what did like you notice? See, like, like when we saw on a fish finder or something like that before on other electronics, you could see perhaps, you know, the, the flasher and you see something come up or you'd see the fish logo or you see that hook go close to your, where your bait, where you know, your bait is, but 
you don't and and you you don't know what your bait's doing down there. Maybe you see like a small little dot, but you don't you don't know. You're seeing on a screen that's four inches big, and you're like, yeah, that's barely moving, and oh, that fish he came right up to it and then left. As soon as you got the camera and you put your bait down, you realize how much your little jig is moving or your spoon when you move the rod it's like moving double what you think it is and all these especially perch because we only have a a short length of the camera line but we were seeing all these perch were like freaking out you got excited to start jigging faster and every single perch was just turning away all of them (laughs) and i mean we were catching fish but we started to notice how many fish we weren't catching yeah. when we had the camera. So like, you know, you'd catch, you know, a bunch of jumbos here, a bunch of dinks there. And then all of a sudden you'd look down the hole and be like, wow, there's a bunch of jumbos. And they would look at your lure, like Andrew said, and just swim away. It's like, well, what's wrong with it? You know, they, even, they were even the a sight ones. hole. When you're looking straight down onto your bait, you still don't see it. And it was, what was shocking is in the camera, we'd see, we'd get all excited and you start that little tremble and you'd see that little jig or that minnow and it's just like quivering. <laughs> That's yeah. enough movement. Yeah. And yeah, we were moving it too much and you could actually see we were a deterrent to that fish striking. Yeah. I, I found that especially nowadays with uh, the use of braided line, a lot of people use hmm. uh, braided line to a leader because, you know, braid is so thin and it's very sensitive. But the other thing or with braid is- fluoro because fluoro is, is on, on that light of- of weight and stuff, it's not going to move either. It's going to be nice and taut and rigid. Yeah, it, it doesn't stretch that much, right? Yeah. So you have like a super non-stretchy line and then you see people just jigging it and their jig underneath the water is just... <laughs> pew, 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 pew. <laughs> and, and the way that you have to think is like, it's cold. Like the water is super cold. Everything's slowing down. Like minnows are slowing down too. So naturally speaking, perch are used to eating like whatever they're eating, say pinhead minnows for, for instance... These minnows aren't swimming around like you see them in the summer. They're not just whipping around. Their their metabolism is slowed down, and they're just slowly swimming around. And all of a sudden, you see your your jig or your spoon that's supposed to be imitating one of those minnows, and it's jumping and fluttering around like crazy. I always say fish are dumb, but they're not stupid, right? They know something's wrong. <laughs> I liken it to I am more likely to drive my car up to a window at McDonald's and order food than I am to go chart, start chasing a cow in a field who can, you know, outperform me in speed and agility <laughs> and try and get a burger that way. Like, no, if it's too much movement, too much effort, it's not worth it. And that's exactly like you said, it's so cold. And unless you're going for lake trout or something where their their prime habitat is that cold water, they're going to be very slow. They're, like they, they will have slowed down from what you would expect in the summertime. So that aggressive jigging technique that you've nailed walleye on you've nailed perch and pike whatever bass you're hitting you know all summer long that is now too fast of a technique to work on those same fish in the cold temperature and another thing i've noticed is like andrew said we would be scaring fish away so if you drop something down quick you might get the attention of like a bunch of jumbos like you see them come in and then they look at your lure and one thing we notice is say we were fishing slob grabbers we'd be jigging them around and i have video like footage of this where I'm jigging a, a slab grabber, not even a lot, maybe like three inches up then back down, three inches up, back down. And they're just staring at it and they won't touch it. And then you just let it hang there and do absolutely nothing. It's just hanging there. And you're like, the fish isn't dumb enough just to come up and eat this piece of metal. And then it just comes up and eats it. <laughs> just hanging there every single time. Like I've had so many people tell me, they're like, just let it hang mm-hmm. there and fish will come up and eat it. We've caught perch just on bare jig heads. Just let it sink down the hole and you're not paying attention and a perch grabs it. Sometimes having literally no action is what they want. Now, on the other hand, sometimes, like Andrew said, with lake trout and other uh, other fish, having more action is more appropriate to getting bites. And like, it depends on the species of fish. And also it depends on the day. Sometimes the fish are a little more amped up. Sometimes they're a little more sluggish. It depends on a lot of factors. But one time that we really like to have a lot of noise and less subtlety, so to say, when we're perch fishing is when we're calling Mm -hmm. fish in. And this is one thing that a lot of guys will say when they're perch fishing, and we've been doing this for many years, is if we get to a spot that we know is good, we have a few spots that we fish on a few different lakes, and we know that there's there's perch there. But we'll drill a hole and we'll, we'll look down. This is even before we had a camera. Having a camera is a big benefit because you can look down the hole and be like, okay, there's nothing here. And then, you know, walk a few more feet, drill a hole, look down and be like, oh, here mm-hmm. they are, right? But if you don't have a camera, 
and you know it's a good spot, you have to drill a hole, you have to call the fish to you. So one thing you can do is you can either pound the bottom with a bait, like a jigging spoon or like a jigging wrap, like Drew was saying last week. Or one of my favorites is a a lipless crankbait. You get those little like rip and wraps, the little guys, and you just chuck it down the hole. I like one that's shiny, especially when it's like bright out. Even like the Rapal, like the the V wrap, like it's it's generally bigger. But if you if you have again on the ice on Simcoe, let's say you're allowed two rods, so I'll have one that's set up with like a small slob grabber or something or a small spoon, small jigging wrap. But then if there's nothing in the area, I put on my my V wrap, drop it down, and I just let it like hammer into the sediment in the bottom, and it puts this big cloud of stuff up around the bait, and then you start ripping it like hard, just you know for a little bit until you start seeing some come in. And then I'll go back to more finesse. Like you got their attention. They're not going to hit that now, but you need to get their attention so that they become like, hey, yeah. what is that? One, one thing I find, especially with perch, which is a very popular species that people like to target, is they're super curious. Like you'll you'll drop yeah. something down and pound the bottom or you'll have like a some kind of, you know, vibrating, rattly bait and you just start, you know, aggressively jigging it. And we're watching on our camera. And the thing is I love about a camera is you learn so much. It was worth every penny, in my opinion. You learn so much. But you'll look down the hole and you'll, you know, we'll be in like, whatever, 15 feet of water. Nothing. You can't see any fish. All of a sudden, Andrew will start jigging. You you hear just, you know, the little lipless crankbait, you know, you can hear it up up on the surface, right? And you'll look on the camera and all of a sudden, you'll just see like a dark shadow come, another one. And all of a sudden, a bunch of perch come. Like, they heard that noise. They don't know what it is. And they swam from wherever they were over. And then I find other perch, when they see other perch somewhere, they're like, oh, what are they looking at? And then other perch come. Before you know it, oftentimes you'll have 20, 30 perch there. Now, if you can attract a school of jumbos, that's even better because you're going to catch some jumbos. But even if you can attract some smaller fish, you're getting fish to the area and you can start catching fish and attracting other ones. But that is one big thing. I just, I feel like a lot of people will get to a hole and be like, you know what? I got this little tungsten with this little tiny, you know, little you know, maggot on it and they just start jigging it. And if there's no fish there, a perch isn't going to see that 20, 30, 40, 60 feet away. You have to bring some loud, noisy bait to call them in. And again, like Andrew said, you might not even catch any fish on that lure. One thing I do like is a little rip and wrap because it's big enough to be noisy, but I've also caught some pretty big jumbos on it too. Yeah, Even the the Z Vibers, they're, they're a nice little small bait too, but they, they can make a lot of noise. Oh yeah, that's yeah. a that's a great one. A bit more expensive Euro on tackle. the pricier side, but again, it, it's yeah. So <laughs> they're they're micro size, but still have a lot of noise. So that's a good option to you can call them in with it, but also you can yeah. also target them with it. And one thing, one last point we'll mention about this whole too much or too little action is the rod you choose can make a difference. Now, the action of the ice rod can make a huge difference, especially if you're jigging. What kind of tip on your ice rod do you like, Andrew? I do like like a very sensitive soft tip. I prefer it. Yeah. If I'm going to be jigging for some for a larger species, I'm using lar- larger baits, then I don't mind a stiffer rod. But if I'm going for like panfish, which I, I love ice fishing for panfish, you know, I, I like to have a very soft tip. <laughs> like I like an ultralight ice rod when I'm going there because as I'm yeah. jigging, it's not as an aggressive like motion. Because when you, even on a small tungsten jig, you lift that rod up and, and that tip bends down, you know, and even if you get the, the yeah. light, the light bite detectors, like the little, uh, spring tips and springs that will soften up your rod tip a lot so that as it moves it's not as much of like a jerking action as it's going around i like a soft tip too when i'm when i'm being finesse because the tip literally just you can bounce it yeah instead of jigging the whole rod up just the tip you can just bounce it you can almost feel like the bait moving up and down Mm -hmm. so if you find that you're someone that overworks your baits try to slow down like it's hard i know <laughs> i'm someone that in the summer when i'm bass fishing i'm a fast reeler i just like reeling a, a you know a chatterbait in really fast it's hard for me to slow down especially when you see if you have electronics and you see something move in and you get excited and you're like i need to get this to strike and you start going. it's hard yeah, yeah. it's hard <laughs> but you can do things like like i said in the summer because i'm a fast reeler one thing that i found that helps me is i use a slower mm-hmm. reel that helps it's not going to help 100%, but it'll help slow you down a little bit. So one thing is if you use a slightly softer rod, that can help you not be so aggressive. If you have a super stiff rod and and braid, which doesn't you know stretch at all, that can really make you overwork your baits in that situation. So keep that in mind. Even, even how you hold your rod can sound, it sounds a little weird, but I remember growing up, like I would always hold it like a summer, like my regular spinning rod. 
where I'm just holding the, the handle, you know, like yep. normal, the real hanging below. And the when I was jigging with that, though, I was more likely to kind of use my wrist and you lift the rod tip just by pivoting your wrist. And even on a two foot rod, that's a lot of movement on that bait. And so now what a lot of guys do is they kind of hold the reel and just their fingers over top of the rod. It looks odd, but it can be fairly comfortable. It's easier to grip things sometimes in the winter that way if you're wearing gloves and whatnot. But with that, you can now just move your whole rod. So you're not tipping your rod anymore because that now kind of feels awkward. So now when you're jigging, you're just lifting that whole rod. So your movement of your hand that you're putting is all the movement that's going to the bait as well. There's no pivoting action that's going to increase that amount of movement down below. So even something small like that could help you to, to you know, not overwork your yeah, bait. Yeah, for sure. And I know like we both started doing that a few years ago and it does make a big difference. It looks, I know a lot of people make fun of you when you do it, if they're not, you know, yeah. an avid ice fisherman, but it does literally make a difference. So that is something cool. So I thought we could just go a little bit into the giveaway because this is a really cool yes. giveaway. So Jeff, as we mentioned, Jeff from Limestone Lures, he's been a huge huge help to the podcast over the years we really appreciate his support and he makes awesome baits you can see my bait wall right here i have a whole rack here of limestone lures and one of my favorite baits that he makes he makes super good little three and a half or four inch swim baits that we use for almost anything trailers for spinner baits chatter baits yeah. buzz baits doesn't matter just on a regular jig head makes tons of stuff lots of bass stuff walleye stuff but we're talking ice fishing this week. He has some really cool ice fishing baits. A lot of stuff that it's almost like, I don't mean to sound like you need to buy this stuff, <laughs> but it's stuff that if you're perch fishing, like yeah. again, this is this, his baits cover a lot of different species of fish, but me and Andrew really love perch fishing ourselves. So some of the baits that he has, I know we're going to use a lot for perch this coming season, hopefully this Saturday. So what are some of the baits that we have a few of them that we have. So we'll show you some of them. Yep. Andrew will show you some of his favorites. So one of my favorite style of baits, he, he has one, it's called the drip tees. Yeah. And it's just got a long like whip tail pretty much. And I love these because they have such, like when I'm not moving my rod at all, and you look at these on a camera, and if you can see down in the water below, or you just put them, you know, put them in your sink so you can see, you'll see that tail just like quivering. It doesn't stop moving. You can't, you can't stop it from moving. And so just that little bit of action, I find like triggers a lot of bites. So I love it. It's a nice, like long, ta long, slender tail yep. on these. So I love that. The cool thing too with these is I know we're talking ice fishing this week, but when I see this, I instantly think crappy. Like I know, yeah. you know, we're just getting into ice fishing season now, but one thing that me and Andrew just started doing <laughs> is going spring fishing for crappy. We love it. it it's, it's great fun. And this, this bait right here, yeah on a jig head under a float lights out doesn't matter crappy any panfish yeah. but another thing also i'll mention about the drip tees because this is probably my overall favorite bait that jeff makes at lime swimmers if you've ever fished for perch have you ever heard of using a high hook me and andrew do that a lot is you'll have like a spoon or a jig or whatever you have tied to the bottom and then about it depends six inches 12 inches 18 inches above your spoon you just have a single hook and then you put a bait. You can put a lot of different kinds of baits, but a drip tease is perfect for that. So what happens is the spoon underneath, oftentimes that'll attract the fish. And if they're being finicky, like we said before, you can just drop the spoon to the bottom or, or lower the water column. <laughs> and then this little drip tease will, will hang there just like a drop shot. And that little tail, like Andrew said, yep. you can't get it to stop moving. The thing's just twitching. <laughs> and oftentimes the perch... We'll just look up and see that and be like, oh, easy meal. And they'll just go up and eat that. And oftentimes you'll catch more fish on the drop on the high hook than on the actual bait. So the drip tease is yeah. like a perfect size because it's not too small, but it's not too big. So it's perfect. Definitely check those yeah. out. Another another couple like super finesse. If you're someone who likes using the tungsten jigs and like a small That's maggot, me. a couple a couple really cool options. He has the, the Mighty Mite and the saucy tail and these are like super saucy finesse. tails would be my pick personally it's tiny yeah. it depends how much you want to look like a critter yeah. too like i've bl i've blown like my nose tail, when again, i had a cold and bigger stuff came yeah. out than this it's tiny <laughs> like how long would you say that is it's not it's it's like half an inch long maybe three quarters yeah, of an inch maybe if you 
yeah, like just over. That's because because it has small yeah. appendages. Like, but the the body of the bait is yeah, like a half inch at most, and especially the saucy tail, it's very oh, very yeah. small. But these are a great option because now instead of just having like uh, an unmoving maggot that's threaded onto the hook, which again, very successful, you can thread one of these on, and now you still have those like tiny little appendages that are just off to the side again moving around in that water so that's that's an awesome option if you like really subtle subtle like presentations i love that's a really cool thing that he has and it's tough i find to get baits like that yes. small especially like with if you look at them too like in the package all of their legs are on like, yeah <laughs> i know i normally get stuff that small like half of it's missing the, the reason for that is and here's the thing a lot of the local bait makers, like we've been a huge supporter. We try our best to buy as much as we can. Like, again, we like some of the bigger brands too, but we try as much as we can to support our local bait makers because they put so much effort and they have so much pride in their work. When you buy, it's happened to me all the time. I'll buy baits from like, you know, some of the bigger companies and you'll get one of the baits that's like deformed or defected and they just throw it in the pack. They don't care. They, they literally don't care. But again, like Andrew said, you look at these baits, you know that Jeff looked at each one of these baits individually and was like, okay, that's good. And he puts it in the package, puts the label on, gave a little kiss, like, perfect. And he puts it in the thing and he does a little happy dance because you bought something from him that he put his blood, sweat and tears into. And every bait is perfect. They're, they're perfect. And they catch fish. I would say though, okay, I know you mentioned this about the saucy tail. Mm -hmm. If you, like Andrew said, if you're an angler that likes using those little tiny tungsten jig heads that are tiny because sometimes those perch or panfish whatever you're fishing for but what i find perch especially later in the season after they've been pounded by everyone out there anything more than a sneeze yeah. spooks them <laughs> these little these little guys on little tungsten absolute dynamite like killer super yeah. good definitely check those out and you know what the mighty might this may be a little bit too much of a of a giveaway right now but the mighty might in the spring under a float for steelhead. Great nymph. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and then he has one more bait that's going to be an absolute killer. A few of the bait makers are making these. Jeff does an absolutely fantastic job. We mentioned this before on last year's episode is the the yep. goober goby. Goby baits have become super popular, obviously, because gobies have become like <laughs> super popular. One of the main <laughs> food sources in a lot of the lakes. But like these baits, they catch everything from again. Generally, you're not fishing for bass through the ice because it's usually closed. But in the summer, you're catching bass on goby baits. Like almost like every lake, almost every lake in Southern Ontario has gobies in them. A lot of them do anyway. But in lakes like Lake Simcoe and other lakes, these goby baits are catching tons of whitefish and lake trout and burbot. Like anything in a lot of these lakes feast on these things. And the goober goby, it's the perfect size. It's not huge. It's not small. It's perfect. That's, I love it. When you look at I, it, like that's the kind of size of a of a minnow that anyone, even going for perch, like you go get a scoop of minnows. That's like one of the bigger ones oh. in the bag. You're like, oh, excellent. Like that's that's what you catch want. a jumbo yeah. perch on this, no problem. Yeah, definitely killer bait. Again, we like to thank Jeff from Limestone Lures. If you would like to support Jeff by buying some of his baits, which I highly recommend because they're good baits, um, I'd recommend checking out his website. He oftentimes has really good sales too. I, I signed up, you know, when you, you put an order through and it's like, sign up for our emails. I'm always like, ah, fine. And oftentimes I'll get an email from Jeff and it'll be like, hey, you know, like 50% off. I was like, okay, how can I resist? <laughs> but anyway, definitely check out his website. We'll put that down below. And if you do buy something from Jeff, we'll have an affiliate link below. We have some affiliate links or some companies that we like to deal with. And we will get a small percentage back which we will actually put i didn't even tell andrew this but whatever we get back from those affiliate links we're actually going to put back into for another giveaway for patreon members so if you reward us we will reward you back but we like to thank jeff for that because jeff actually set that up for us too so definitely check that out so our next point is it's kind of like what we were talking about about the base is size yes. matters i know like guys hear that a lot right <laughs> size matters but sometimes fish are finicky and like i mentioned before early ice it's insane like you know like the fish are like hey i haven't seen a bait in months and they're just smacking anything right you know what i mean but like after a while like i'm talking late february even mid-february when it kind of gets into that lull you know the perch especially on like the more popular areas or whatever fish you're fishing for 
they've seen everything. They, <laughs> yeah. They've seen it, you know, like, oh, a jigging wrap. Yep. I've seen that 50 times on the weekend, you know, or like a slab grabber. I've seen like a thousand of them if you swam through the perch grounds, right? So what do you do, Andrew, on days like that when you just know the fish have seen everything? What, what, what are you going to tie on? We're, we're just going to talk about perch today just because I'm in a perchy mood. Yeah, I I downsize, 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 downsize. Because the chances of me finding a, a, an ice fishing bait that hasn't been thrown to them is like, oh, I'll try the Meigs jigs. I heard those are good. It's like, guess what? They've seen a million of those. You know, jig and wrap, like, guess what? They've seen a million of those. But when it gets small, and uh, now this might just be the human in me talking, and I know that fish aren't as smart as us sometimes, but <laughs> the smaller something is, the less detail you see in it. <laughs> <laughs> and unless you might be concerned about it so with something like this like when you when you downsize to like a really like micro jig or something like that and you drop that down a perch is going to come by you know and i won't even move it don't like they, they're they're so wary of of anything they think anything spooks them so they come across I'm like there's something floating that i could fit in my mouth I'm like all right <laughs> and they'll just yeah. like eat it but they they don't seem to really give too much thought to it when it's when it is such a small morsel definitely downsize for me too one one thing like we mentioned last week in the the podcast with dc hooked angling drew is like jigging wraps like i love fishing a jigging wrap for perch it's one of my favorite baits ever it's more of an aggressive bait you know you can get small ones but generally speaking it's not what i'd call a finesse bait Mm -hmm. it's swinging around you know you pound it in the bottom it's got you know three hooks right it's just like it's a big bait you know so when we get to those days when the fish are very finicky, I love just dropping down one of those tiny little tungstens, you know, tiny little tungsten, with just a tiny little bait on it. And just like Andrew said, sometimes not even moving it. Sometimes I'll just put my rod down. Like I will look at the camera and be like, okay, there's some perch down there. Drop the rod down and just put it on the end of the chair and just let it hang there. And you'll see the fish. Like I said, perch are curious. They're dumb. Like they're pretty dumb. They're not stupid, but they're dumb. <laughs> And they'll yep. come up and look at it. And like, say like, for instance, um, one thing that another point we we're going to talk about is like scent. Mm-hmm. That's one of the most like debated things in the fishing industry. I think like people are like, oh, scent doesn't matter and blah, blah, blah. I'm a huge believer that scent does matter. I don't think it matters as much as we all think, but I think it matters enough that we should consider it. We all have scent on our, on our fingers. If you're someone that smokes, you should quit. But if you smoke, <laughs> you're going to have that. <laughs> smell on your hands and if you touch a bait and then drop it down the hole your bait is going to smell unnatural or maybe Mm -hmm. you had gas on your hands from your gas auger or something on your hands it's not going to smell normal so one thing about scent is like especially with jeff alimson lures he has like a very it's a strong fishy scent on his baits and i feel like if you're just hanging something super small and finessey down and that fish comes up and looks at it if he's already finicky and it smells weird, he's not going to hit it. <laughs> he, if he's finicky and he looks at it, it looks real. It's the size of something that he's normally going to eat and it smells good. Way more likely, in my opinion, that he's going to hit it. So I think scent, like you can either get, you know, if you're using plastic baits that are scented, you can also get scents that you can add on to bait. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, one of my favorites is smelly jelly. I don't know if you've ever used that, Andrew, but like smelly jelly is a classic. It smells rancid. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but the fish, for some reason, like it. It may just be a confidence boost thing for me. But in my opinion, I've had days when it's been slow and I just put a little bit on the bait and it seems to work. So I, I am a firm believer that scent plays a factor. And for me, it, it depends on the presentation. If, like I said before in the podcast, if it's a fast presentation, no, ice fishing is a slow presentation. But let's say, like, for argument's sake, summertime, you're fishing a chatterbait. I don't think they're going to stop and, like, follow it for a while and smell it. Like, no, they're in a chase mode. doesn't matter yeah. what it smells like. It's a reaction. Looking at the action. Yeah. yeah. But if you have, if you're, you know, any, anything that is a, like, if you're going carp fishing or if you're, uh, you know, drop shotting sometime. But if you're fishing, like, live bait or something, you're fishing a worm under a bobber, that odor is a big thing as to why they hit it. And I know that because if I put on just a crappy rubber bait under a hook and I put a dead worm, so it's not moving either, on a hook, guess what I'm going to get bit on every single time? It's the worm. Why? Because it's not moving. Nothing's changed with it. It could be the exact same color and everything, but there's an odor. 
So I'm a believer that if it's a slower presentation, scent will play a factor. So when you're ice fishing, yeah, you're hanging these things in the water. So if there's like a nice odor that's emanating from that, yeah, they're going to be, why wouldn't you, you use anything that could be an advantage to you in that circumstance? Exactly. And it, scents aren't that expensive. You can get, you know, a little jar of scent for 10 bucks. And it'll, I've had a, a thing of smelly jelly for years. Like you'd, you're not gobbing it on all your lures. It's just a little bit on. So I think a lot of people don't believe it works, which I find interesting. But hey, that's just my opinion. What I'd, like, I'd like to ask people like that, how they fish. What presentations are they using where they say that yeah. though? Because yeah, if, if I'm putting on a crankbait, I don't care if they're sent or not. <laughs> Andrew's like, I'll just snag the fish right in the mouth. It doesn't matter. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just that good. <laughs> so the last point we, we're going to cover today, because we're kind of going a little bit over time, is should you stay at a spot or should you hole hop? Now, I'm a, I'm a huge hole hopper. I love just drilling, fishing for five, 10 minutes, being like, nope, gone. Like, I think we did a day a few years ago where we drilled 60 holes. <laughs> yeah. I hate sitting still. Like, I, I'm the kind of guy where I, I I I used to fish with a guy who he would drill a hole and sit there all day. And, and he'd be totally fine with that. That would be chill. He's like, no, no, we'll call the fish in. Don't worry about it. If I'm fishing for an hour and I haven't seen a fish, I'm gone. I'm drilling a hole. I'm I'm walking and not just 10 feet. I'm walking 100 feet, drilling a hole, dropping the camera down, looking around. Unless you have a specific spot, like if you're fishing for lake trout or something like that, when you're fishing for schooling fish like perch, if I can find that school of fish and just drop baits on top of their head, in my opinion, that can be better than sitting in a spot for hours waiting for them to come by. Because sometimes you'll fish and they just won't come by. Just that day, they just won't be in the area and you can't call them in. And if you had moved maybe, you know, a quarter of a mile the other way, you would have found them and caught fish. So that's just my thing is... I feel like depending on the species you're fishing for, hole hopping can be huge. I know a lot of guys that fish crappy will drill like 50 holes and they'll just be like, nope, they're not here. They're not here. And they'll just find the fish because the fish are literally just in one spot. They're not roaming around like perch do. I know Andrew, he goes hole hopping with me. I don't know if he likes it or not, but he goes with me. I don't mind moving, you know, a few times over the course of the day, but I'm also like fishing for me. And I know what it is for Jesse too. Like it's a relaxation, like outlet, right? So when I go fishing and if I've had, you know, like, I, like I'm itching to get out. So when I go out this weekend with Jesse, I, I want to get on fish. I want to go. I'm going to push hard. But if I'm like, I'm dead tired and I'm like, you know what? I just want to go out on the ice and relax. I'll drill like a couple holes and I'll sit in my hut, nice and toasty warm. I'll cook nice food. And that's, that's what I want to do. I'm not moving. I don't need to. I'm just enjoying my day. <laughs> so there's, there's pluses and minuses to, to both. I think that depending, like, like Jesse said, if we're fishing for perch, we will catch more perch if we're running and gunning. Absolutely. I, I wouldn't argue that point ever. There are times where the perch, they happen to be under you and they stay under you and, and their school's moving around and you get a new one every half hour and you don't have to move anyways. But those days are few and far between, I find. You know, it, it can be more relaxing to stay in one area, but it can be more productive to move around. I, I We have had a few days where we've been in either a hut or we've been, you know, and just drilling holes out and we've sat on a spot all day mm-hmm. and caught fish consistently. And, it, and like you said, you'll catch a bunch and then like there'll be a slow period. Then another school will come in. And those are my day, favorite days. Those are great It's literally days. the best of the both worlds. Yeah. Especially like, if you're setting a no hut outside. up. Yeah. Right. If you're setting a hut up and all the, you know, everything moving is a pain in the butt. Yes. But that being said, especially if you only have a hand auger. So once we got the, like we just use a drill, but once you got that drill, we started running and gunning a lot more because Jesse's like, we, we don't have to kill ourselves trying to drill all these holes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I can drill a hole in like eight seconds. Who cares? I'll draw like <laughs> 700 of them. You have two big 12 amp DeWalt batteries. You're good. You draw like 300 holes. You're good. <laughs> so anyway, I really enjoyed this episode. Again, it's ice fishing season. We're really stoked. And I know in Ontario, a lot of people, especially maybe the last week or two, have just been starting to get out. So if you're getting out for the first time, have fun, be safe. You know, there's some tips that we shared today, but definitely check out some videos on YouTube that are much more informative than what we described of how to get out of the water if you do fall in. But have fun. Ice fishing is a great time. Again, we'd highly recommend... You listened to last episode if you didn't, because Drew, he's a fishing guide. 
He gave a lot of really beneficial tips also on safety as well. One thing that we would like to mention too for the giveaway is that Jeff from Limestone Lures, definitely again, check out the link below. There's an affiliate link too if you do buy something. What he is giving away, if you're a Patreon member, you'll be automatically entered and we will be announcing the winner on Patreon. So download the Patreon app. You can follow along even as a free member. You won't be able to enter as the giveaways, but you can watch for the giveaways too. We'll announce the winner on the giveaway there. The cool thing that Jeff is going to do, he's super flexible. I don't know if he can like do the splits, but like he's flexible in his giveaways. <laughs> so if you are someone that likes ice fishing, he is offering an ice fishing package where it'll be a bunch of ice fishing baits and he'll ship it right to your door. If you're not someone who ice fishes, he is totally chill with that. He doesn't judge you, probably not. And he will send you baits for uh, other species that you can definitely discuss with him. So you don't have to, I know a lot of people are like, ah, I love these ice fishing episodes, but I don't ice fish. That's yep. cool. Jeff will definitely handle that. Next week, we have another cool giveaway too, but we'll talk about that next week. So just some last, what, what do you call it? Housekeeping. Yep. <laughs> Make sure to write us a review. We're trying to get um, a lot of reviews because I know a lot of you have given us a review, but say you, here's a tip. Say you listen to us on Spotify, go on Apple and give us a review there too. <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> what happens was when we get more reviews, which are all fantastic. If you have given us a review in the past, really appreciate it. It actually helps mm -hmm. us rate better in the podcast charts, which helps us get bigger sponsors, which helps us have bigger giveaways for you guys. So it also helps us keep on going. So we really appreciate if you do that. Our Patreon link as well, if you'd like to support the show is down in the show notes. So we have, as tradition states, the quote of the week and to give us that the man with i can't even say it anymore i usually say the man with the mustache but he has a full beard now so <laughs> the man with the beard andrew <laughs> but tune in next week same average podcast same average time <laughs>